part 21 in our Revelation study, and uh, it's a sermon that um, I've been keen to do for a while. I have done sermons on this topic in the past. I've called the sermon, The Rapture Question Answered, and I, I just want to present something to you. It's going to challenge, I think just about everybody here is going to be challenged in some way or another by what I present, and please, let's not hate each other as a result, because we know that um, the rapture has caused more divisions in church than I think just about any other doctrine. Um, it's caused churches to split. Um, there's certain churches, if you don't believe a certain way, you're not welcome to preach or, you know, and all, all sorts of things going on there. And it's, it's amazing and crazy at the same time that um, such a, an issue would be such a divisive issue. And so when I bring this uh, topic up and as, I, as we start to go through these scriptures that I'm going to present to you, just keep in mind that um, you may have not have heard a sermon quite like this, presented the way I'm going to present it. You would have heard pretty much everything that you would have heard to the most part to do with the rapture would have been conflicting with what I'm about to say. And I... <laughs> Thanks, Elon. Um, but at the same time, please love me afterwards. All right, because it's not a issue that uh, is whether you can, you're welcome in the church or not. It's not a church membership issue at all. All right, uh, only the blood of Jesus and accepting that He died on the cross for your sins. That's uh, that's the most important part. That's how you get into the church. Amen. The rapture question answered. Why should we look at the rapture? Let's have a look at Matthew twenty four forty two. If you're all there, Matthew twenty four forty two, and it says this. Therefore, keep watch. What does keep watch mean? Be on your guard, keep watch. I always think of soldiers on the wall of a city and they're always watching for, you know, they watch for a few things. They watch for the presence of enemies and they watch for the coming of the king. You know, when the king comes, they say, open the gates. Just about sound like a psalm there. Be lifted up your ancient doors that the king of glory may come in. 2442, therefore keep watch because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. So he says, keep watch. Which means we've got to watch the scriptures, look to the scriptures, be clear in our mind. Because we don't want to be thinking he's coming at this hour and then he comes at this hour. And we don't want to put all our eggs into this hour and then he comes at this hour and we could miss out on something very special. Our oil could run out. Do you know what I mean? Because this says that in the last days, there's going to be a great falling away of the church. The church will fall away because it's going to come under severe persecution. And they said the love of most will grow cold, referencing the church, that the love of most will grow cold and there'll be a massive falling away of believers and the church will become a remnant. Now, you don't want to be part of the falling away. So he says, keep watch because no one knows the hour or the day that I come. But we can know the season. When the fig leaf sprouts, we know summer is near. The rapture question answered. Today I will be delivering a message which I believe will challenge many of you in relation to your view of the timing of the rapture of the church. Please listen like a Berean Christian and examine the scriptures daily to see if what I'm saying is in fact true. So don't judge until you've done your research. Amen. Um, as they say, condemnation before investigation is not wise. The information I'm bringing to you has come from many years of study and research. This didn't just come yesterday. This has been 20 years in the making. Um, actually, before I even went to church, I'd read the whole Bible. And when I got to church, I thought, oh, I, I misunderstood this part of end times. So the end time scenario, because I just read it without any commentary, just read it pure, the words just came straight into me and I, I had already could understand the, the end time scenario and then I went to church and I got told a completely different end time scenario and I just went, okay, I must have been wrong because these guys have been in it a lot longer than me. This topic should not be a point of Christian division, but at the same time we should study it to make sure we are as accurate as Scripture can make us. Don't you think? If Scripture can give us more clarity, I believe we should go to the Scriptures and receive more clarity in relation to the rapture. There's a guy called Don Stewart, and he said, almost everyone agrees that there is no single verse or passage that gives an undeniable or irrefutable answer to the question of the timing of the rapture. That's what he said. 
Well, I would like to disagree, as there are many scriptures, many scriptures. Actually, what I'm going to present to you is just a few of the many. The problem seems not to be that there's a lack of scriptures that speak about the timing. It, the problem seems to be the way those scriptures are interpreted in relation to one's view that you hold. If you hold a certain view, you don't see the scriptures speak clearly in relation to it. I have always approached scripture by adjusting my view to align with scripture. Not changing or reinterpreting scripture to align with my view. And there's many, many uh, cults out there that have been started. They have a view and they make scripture uh, align with their view. Does that make sense? Yes. And there's even many ministers that do it. And, you know, uh, we, we all could be guilty of it. I'm not saying I'm not guilty of it, but we've got to be careful that our view keeps getting adjusted as we look to the scriptures. So when will the rapture occur? With this in mind, let's begin looking at the scriptures to get a perspective of when the rapture will occur in relation to the Great Tribulation, which is the last seven years of the Earth's history. And we'll understand the timing. You'll find today, as we look to the scriptures, that the day of the Lord... The resurrection and the rapture are simultaneous. The day of the Lord, the day the Lord returns, which is his second coming. The resurrection, which is the resurrection of the dead, and the rapture all occur simultaneously. Actually, it will be the Lord comes, the resurrection of the dead will occur, and then those who are alive will be taken up to be with him. So that's a big key in, in understanding the timing of the rapture because it happens at, at the resurrection and it happens on the day of the Lord. Does that make sense? Yeah. So I'm trying to make it really, really simple. Isaiah 13, 9 to 11 says, See, the day of the Lord is coming. Listen to this. A cruel day with wrath and fierce anger to make the land desolate and to destroy the sinners within it. The stars of heaven and their constellations will not show their light. The rising sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. I will punish the world for its evil, the wicked for their sins. I will put an end to the arrogance of the haughty and will humble the pride of the ruthless. So the day of the Lord is a day when Jesus comes to put an end. And it's on that day. It's not seven years as one day, it's the day he returns. So there will be a single moment in a day when Jesus will return. That is the day. Now, many um, people try to twist that view, to, uh, that scripture to align with their view, and they say that day is a seven-year period. It doesn't say that, because Jesus doesn't come for seven years continuously, does he? Every day he keeps coming and coming and coming and coming. He's not... He's one moment and one day is the day of the Lord. And we've got to keep that in because it just runs in, in line with truth and reality, actually. Just reality and makes sense. Joel 2, 1 to 2 says, Blow the trumpet in Zion, sound the alarm on my holy hill. Let all who live in the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming. It is close at hand. A day of darkness and gloom. A day of clouds and blackness. Like dawn spreading across the mountains, a large and mighty army comes, such as never was of old, nor ever will be in ages to come. Joel 2, 11 to 12 says, The Lord thunders at the head of his army. His forces are beyond number. The mighty are those, and mighty are those who obey his command. The day of Lord is great and it is dreadful. Who can endure it? Even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting, weeping and mourning. So he's declaring, I'm coming fast, weep and mourn for your sin. Joel 2, 31 to 32, the sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and dreadful day. So when you see the sun turning to darkness and the moon to blood, you will know that's happening as a sign that the Lord is very soon coming. Not necessarily that moment, but he's coming. He'll still be like a thief. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. For on Mount Zion and Jerusalem there will be deliverance, as the Lord has said, among the survivors whom the Lord calls. 
So there'll still be salvation right up to the moment, up to the moment when he's about to return. You can still get saved. Amen. Isaiah 34, 2-4, The Lord is angry with all the nations. His wrath is upon all their armies. He will totally destroy them. He will give them over to slaughter. Their slain will be thrown out. Their dead bodies will send up a stench. And the mountains will be soaked with their blood. All the stars of the heaven will be dissolved. And the sky rolled up like a scroll. All the starry hosts will fall like withered leaves from the vine, like shriveled figs from the fig tree. This is a terrible day, but it's a wonderful day for a believer. Amen. It's the most glorious day for believers. But for those that don't know Jesus, it's horrifying and a fearful day. So the day of the Lord is the actual day of the return of Christ. Because that's what those scriptures all pertain to. The coming of the Lord, the end of all things, the, the final bit of the whole terrible scenario is played out. And the Lord returns at that moment. It is a dreadful day for those who hate God, but a glorious day for believers. Now let's find out what else happens on this day. It's important that we find it, because it's not just that. There's a bit more to it. John 6.39 says, This is the will of the Father who sent me, that of all he has given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise them up when? So if you can read it. At the last day. So raise who up? Those who believe. The, that's the resurrection. John 6.40, and this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life, and I will, the promise, raise him up at when? The last day. John 6.44, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. Let's all say this one together. John 6.54, whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. And I will raise him up at the last day. Even Martha knew this. John eleven twenty four. 24, Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. So the resurrection, the last day, the coming of the Lord, I won. Jesus tells the timing of his coming. Let's turn to Mark 13. And this is powerful stuff, this description now. So let's turn there and so we can follow it through together. We're probably all going to have different translations, but that's all right. 13, verse 5, Jesus said to them, is everyone there yet? Jesus said to them, watch out that no one deceives you. It's an interesting warning, isn't it? Be careful. Many will come in my name claiming that I am he and will deceive many. When you hear, hear of wars and rumours of wars, do not be alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places and famines. Uh, and then you'll be secretly raptured before all the beginning of the birth pains. Does it say that? No. It doesn't say that. I didn't add that. I, that was a joke, so I didn't really add it in. But it doesn't say that, does it? There's not a little rapture there, is there? Before these terrible days. It just doesn't say anything about a rapture. These are the beginnings of the birth pains. You must be on your guard. You'll be handed over to the local councils, but don't worry, you'll be raptured. <laughs> no, it doesn't say that. It says you must be on your guard. You will be handed over to the local councils and flogged. Okay? I didn't say that, so I'm not giving you that warning. Jesus is, and I'm just passing it on. So Jesus is telling us this, that some of us could get flogged. On account of me, you will stand before governors and kings as witnesses to them. We saw that with the Apostle Paul. And the gospel must first be preached to all nations. Whenever you are arrested and brought to trial, do not worry beforehand what, about what to say. Just say whatever is given you at the time, for it is not you speaking, but who? The Holy Spirit. Brother will betray brother to death. And a father is child. Children will rebel against their parents and have them put to death. All men will hate you because of me, but you'll be raptured, so don't worry about it. It doesn't say that. I'm, I'm stressing this because it's a clear point here. This is going to happen to believers. All men will hate you because of me, but he who stands firm to the when? To the end. Or is it he who stands firm to seven years before the end? Or he who stands firm to the end will be saved. When you see what? The abomination that causes desolation, standing where it does not belong, 
Let the reader understand that let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let no one on the roof of his house go down or enter the house or take anything out. But don't worry, you're going to be raptured. Doesn't say that, does it? It's telling us, it's warning us to get ready for something terrible. Let no one in the field go back and get his cloak. How dreadful it will be in those days for pregnant women and nursing mothers. Pray that this will not take place in winter because those will be days of distress. What does it say there? Some translations will say those will be days of tribulation, unequaled from the beginning when God created the world until now and never to be equaled again. So what's that? That is clearly the seven or the three and a half year tribulation, the great tribulation, because the, it couldn't be called the great tribulation if this one's greater. This is the greatest one. It can never be equaled again. There will be days of tribulation that will never be equaled again. At that time, if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or look, there he is, do not believe it, for false Christs and false prophets will appear and perform signs and miracles to deceive the elect. So during these terrible times, you'll see false Christs and false messiahs standing up and trying to deceive people. But the elect who are watching and understand these things will not be deceived because we will be uh, looking to the Scriptures like Bereans and making sure we're not getting deceived so that we don't run after a false Christ. Because people will be looking for Jesus at those times. You know? Because when these great, terrible times are coming, you'll be going, oh, Jesus has got to return. Oh, there he is. Oh, he's up on the hill. Oh, there he is out in the field. Oh, there he is in the desert. Let's go and follow him. But it's not him. Because as, as lightning flashes from the east as the west, so is the coming of the Son of Man. That's how we'll know he's going to go white lightning across the sky and every eye will see him, even those who've pierced him. So, look, here's the Christ, or there he is. Do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will appear and perform signs and miracles to deceive the elect, if that were possible. So be on your guard. I have told you everything ahead of time. And it says earlier, let no one deceive you on this matter. But in those days, what does it say here? What's the next word in, on, in your Bibles? Following. following. What was yours? Following that distress. In your days, Following. In your days, following that distress, which is the great tribulation, which is the worst days in history, following the distress of those days, the sun will be darkened. Is this what we've just read in Isaiah? Is this not what we've just read in the book of Joel? The sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from the sky and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. And then the next word's key. At that time. So do we have a time when Jesus will return? Yes. Yes. Clear as day. Amen. At that time, men will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. And he will send his angels. This is the rapture. Read these words carefully. And he will send his angels. How are we going to get raptured? By angels. Isn't that beautiful? To get picked up by angels. And he will send his angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from one end of the earth to the other. At that time, after the distress of those days, he will come. Mark 13, 13, all men will hate you because of me, but he who stands firm to the end will be saved. Not he who stands firm to seven years before the end, or three and a half years before the end, or one year before the end. It's saying to the end. He would have made it clear. If it was sooner, he would have made it clear. Mark 13, 19, for those days will be a time of tribulation such as not occurred since the beginning of the creation which God created until now and never will, in other versions, be equal again. So we'll never have worse times than these. Mark 13, 24 to 27. But in those days following, following that distress, the sun will be darkened, etc. At that time, these are words that we must take literally. He's giving us key moments in time and we have to understand them so that we don't get deceived like the rest of men. Luke 
21, 25 to 28 says, There will be signs in the sun, the moon and the stars on the earth. Nations will be in anguish and perplexity at the roaring and the tossing of the sea. Men will faint from terror, apprehensive of what is coming on the world, for the heavenly bodies will be shaken at that time. There it is again. At that time they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. When you see these things, or when these things begin to take place, stand up, lift up your heads, because your redemption is drawing near. And that's the time. Second coming, rapture, resurrection, 1 Thessalonians 4, 13, 18. Now with that in mind, with these, these scriptures and the understanding what the day of the Lord is and when the resurrection occurs and when the rapture occurs in relation to that, we can read this with more clarity. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13, 18. Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about the, those who fall asleep in death so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus that's the, those souls that have died, those who have fallen asleep in him. And according to the Lord's words, or word, we tell you that we who are still alive and who are left until the coming of the Lord will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. And we're going to get a clear understanding of the timing of when the rapture occurs and the resurrection and the reclaiming of our imperishable bodies. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God. So it's a noisy occasion. It's not quite a secret. It's noisy. Trumpets will be going off. And it's just going to be a, a massive, massive event. The whole world will see it and witness it. And with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up. The apatso. Caught up. Raptured. With them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. And this is what I'm doing today. I'm encouraging you in, in this 1 Corinthians 15, 51 to 52. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the last trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. So my question is, when is the last trumpet? Let's see if this aligns with what I've been teaching thus far. So turn to Revelation 11. Who watched that video I sent out a link to during the week? Yeah. And you, I, I made a, a parallel between God's, uh, the seven bowls of God's wrath to the seven trumpets. And the, it was a clear uh, parallel, wasn't it? That they're pretty much the same event uh, uh, or same prophecy. It's done twice. And we know from Revelation 11 just a bit earlier. Oh, sorry, in Revelation 10. That he was told to make a fresh prophecy, a to prophesy again. So at that point, just before the seventh trumpet prophecy was about to be given to him, he was told, but you will prophesy, you must prophesy again. And that's in Revelation 10 verse 11. If you just look at Revelation 10 verse 11, it said, then I was told you must prophesy again about many people's nations, languages and kings. So what that means is this prophecy is coming to an end and I'm about to give you a fresh one. So the seventh trumpet is one prophecy, and then there's another prophecy that uh, continues from that point, and that goes into the seven bowls of God's wrath, or the seven vials of God's wrath. And it says this, because remember it says, we'll be changed in a flash, in a twinkling of, of an eye, at the last trumpet. And the last trumpet is in Revelation 11, 15 to 19. And it says, the seventh angel sounded his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven which said, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. And the 24 elders who were seated on their thrones before God fell on their faces and worshipped God, saying, we give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, who is and who was, because you have taken your great power and what have begun to reign. At that moment, the reigning of Christ begins at the seventh trumpet. The nations were angry and your wrath has come. So the wrath has come and uh, has, been, has been executed on earth. The time has come now for the judging of the dead and for rewarding your servants, the prophets and your saints and those who reverence your name, both small and great, and for destroying those who destroy the earth. And that would be 
casting those into hell that uh, won't go into eternity. So the time of judgment has come. So that is the end. The seventh trumpet is the end. And it's just exactly that you get a similar sort of explanation at the seventh vial or the seventh bowl of God's wrath, a pretty much a similar lineup of things that occur. And so that's when the last trumpet is. And that's that the end, isn't it? After everything is completed. Does the Bible reveal the timing of the rapture of the church? Of course. It occurs at the second coming of Jesus Christ. Does the Bible reveal the timing of the second coming of Jesus Christ? Of course. After the days of distress unequaled from the beginning when God created the world until now and never to be equaled again. That's when it occurs. Because the Bible says so. Not because I say so, or not because there's a theory I've made up. It's not because of I've been getting taught this from a seminary uh, lecturer and I've come to these conclusions. It's because the Bible says it. And it's clear as that. And I'm, there's a lot of other things, and there's a few of you that might, well, what about this and what about this? Well, I'm going to be talking about a number of other things that people say to refute this view, and I'm going to clarify them for you so that you can see it. Many believers will say, but God has not appointed the church to suffer wrath. Who said that? Yeah, heaps of people say that. And therefore, since there are seven bowls of God's wrath being poured out on the earth, we will be gone before he pours them out. Is that the logic that people use? This may seem logical, but are those who claim this correctly handling the word of God? Let's take a look. Wrath is always mentioned in relation to salvation. God's wrath. Where it says, 1 Thessalonians 5, 9 to 11, For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. He didn't appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation. That's the reference. It's not talking about tribulation. Actually, it says through much tribulation you'll enter the kingdom of heaven. It's not talking about tribulation. Actually, God's not concerned about a Christian dying on this planet in the sense that they just come to be with him. So it's not about protecting this earthly body from death. It's not about protecting this earthly body from going through tribulation. It's about getting people saved for eternity. Amen. So God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. He died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together. This is a beautiful hope, the blessed hope. Therefore, encourage one another, build each other up, just as in fact you are doing. Romans 5, 8 to 10 says, But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, but Christ died for us. And since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if when we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? So this is important. The wrath referred to in these scriptures, when translated from the Greek word, um, the Greek word they use is organ. Don't correct me, Bill. Which comes from the verb orago, meaning to team, to swell, and thus implies that it is not a sudden outburst, it's not a sudden outburst of wrath, but it is a fixed, controlled, passionate feeling against sin, a settled indignation. It is a wrath that never ends. That's very, very important. This wrath is the wrath of hell. So when he says, you will not suffer the wrath of God, it's saying, if you believe in Jesus Christ and he died for your sins, you won't go to hell. That's the reference. It should not be used as a reference to tribulation. Clearly. Because it has no... That's what I mean by handling the word of God correctly. We've got to see it for what it is. Keep it in the context of, of what it pertains to. 1 Thessalonians 1.10, Jesus delivered us... And get that word, delivered us, past tense, from the wrath, which is the word organ, hell, to come. 1 Thessalonians 5, 9, For God hath not appointed us to wrath, and that's, again, organ, hell, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. And Romans 5, 9 says, Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath, organ, hell, through him? These scriptures are not discussing tribulation, but salvation. From hell. However, the two Thessalonian verses 
have been used by pre-wrath and pre-tribulationists to indicate that God will not have us on earth during the wrath of God being poured out. Revelation 16.1, it says, And I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, Go your ways and pour out the vials of the wrath of God upon the earth. Now that word there for wrath is the word thymu. And it indicates rage, personal venting of anger. When a father gets angry with his son for doing something naughty, that's a thymu wrath. It's not an organ wrath. It's not a fixed wrath that you you know you destroy the child. It's a thymu wrath where he gets a good spanking if he if you're an old school parent. <laughs> um, it indicates rage, personal venting of anger. Thymos is used of God's perfect holy wrath in Revelation 14:10, etc. This anger is directed against sin with intense opposition, an anger that burns for a while and then it ceases. So they pour out the wrath and it pours on certain parts of the earth. And then God also says, when you see these things begin to happen, get out of the cities. If you're in Judea, flee, get out. So he's telling his people, like he told Lot, get out. You know, don't stay in there because I'm about to do something. So I, I know that God's in these days, God will be speaking to his people. And if something's going to happen in Adelaide, he'll let us all know. And there will be this exodus of Christians and people will be going, why are the Christians driving off? You know what I mean? Well, they won't really know. They will just... Church, Sunday will come and there'll be no one in the churches, except a few unbelievers. <laughs> one thing to be understood here is that God's wrath is not directed at believers at that time, just as God did not direct his Thymu wrath in Egypt against Moses and the Israelites, but rather against the disobedient Egyptians. When we look at what happened in Egypt, when we look at the, the Thymu wrath that was poured out in Egypt, that, that's like a typology of the Great Tribulation. Because at that time, that was the great tribulation of the Old Testament. And, and Sodom and Gomorrah, there was no righteous men in Sodom and Gomorrah except Lot and his family, so God got them out. You know, if you're righteous in Christ, then we have his righteousness. We will get told to get out. So there's no concern for me in relation to, you know, we're not under the wrath of God in that sense. We're not even under his thymu wrath. Definitely, we won't be under his organ wrath. But sometimes God corrects us, you know, sometimes God, you know, um, teaches us things through uh, putting us through hardships so that we learn a lesson. You know, remember Peter was, uh, Satan wanted to sift him like wheat, and he says, don't worry Peter, I've prayed for you. You know, but he knew that he had to let him get sifted like wheat because he would become Peter. But he had to go through it. And you know, sometimes I think the tribulation, as much as it's for the disobedient, I think it's sometimes, uh, I think it's, it's for this church of this day to wake us up, to help us to get it together, to help us to become harvesters in a harvest field that no one wants to work in. The labourers are few, as the word says. The timing of the rapture in reference to the return of Christ and the resurrection is made clear in Scripture, but it's not clear it's not clear. None of those scriptures are clear if, if you hold to any other view uh, apart from post-tribulational. If you hold a pre-tribulation view or a pre-wrath or a mid-wrath, none of what I've said makes sense because it just doesn't equate with your view. But if you don't let that get in the way and you just go, what does the scriptures say? And then I have to accept it. Then you become a post-tribulationist. You have to be. But I'm not telling you you have to be. But that's what the obvious outcome of it would be. The four views of the rapture, there's the pre-trib, the mid-trib, the pre-wrath, and the post-trib. We have a, a tribulation period. It's uh, also called the 70th week of Daniel. Now, I haven't got time to get into all of the eschatology there, but there's a three and a half year peace treaty period where the Antichrist will sign a peace treaty with Israel. Then there was a three and a half year, approximately, year great tribulation. That's all up for because there's no reference to when will the first vial be poured out or when will the first trumpet blow or when will the first seal be broken. We don't know exactly in that period, but it's, it's assumed or it's to the most part, it's within that three and a half year period, not assumed, it is within that last three and a half year period. The Antichrist will sign a peace treaty with Israel at, at that time, before the, uh, at, at the start of the seven year period, and then the Antichrist will break the peace treaty with Israel and that's when God will pour out his wrath. So the pre view thinks that that they'll be raptured before any of that. Way back before. It could be a month before, it could be a day before, but it's before. So they won't actually see the Antichrist. That's what 
very staunch pre-trips will believe they won't even see the Antichrist. The mid-trip believes it's in the middle. The pre-wrath believes it's in there somewhere, in between mid-trib and the end. And then there's the post-trib, which believes that the tribulation will finish and there will be a period of time talked about in Daniel, at the end of Daniel, and Jesus will return somewhere there like a thief. So you have to be, even after the tribulation, we've got to be on our guard, that we don't fall away from the truth, that we hold to Jesus right to the moment he comes. But I'll talk about that, uh, that section of Daniel another time. Issues with the pre-trib rapture. This is for you to see it. Uh, gone before the Antichrist is revealed. So let's have a look at 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 to 3. So turn to 2 Thessalonians. They believe you will be gone. Don't worry. Before any of these, t oh, who's been in church? And I've been in churches and, you know, there's going to be all these terrible, terrible times. But don't worry, saints, you'll be gone before any of it happens. We won't see any of these things because God's gracious. He's going to have us out of here. We'll be gone. But does it say here in 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 1, it says, Concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to him. So it's concerning the rapture. We ask you, brothers, not to become easily unsettled or alarmed by some prophecy report or letter supposed to have come from us, saying that the day of the Lord, so he's talking about the day of the Lord, that the day of the Lord has already come. Then these words are very, very important. Don't let anyone deceive you. In any way, in any way, not even in the remotest way. He's saying that for a purpose. And I'll tell you about that purpose a bit later. Don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day will not come until the rebellion occurs. What's the rebellion? The apostasy, some versions say. The great falling away. So the day of the Lord, the coming of Jesus will not occur until we see the church completely fall away. Many Christians will give up the faith. Then you've got to ask your question, why? Because maybe they were deceived in thinking the day of the Lord has already come or that it should have come and that didn't come and we were not supposed to be here because my pastor's been telling me for the last 25 years not to be, that we won't have to suffer these things, that we shouldn't have seen the Antichrist. But the Scriptures say, don't let anyone deceive you in any way for that day will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness, who's that? The Antichrist is revealed. So the issue over the pre-trip rapture is you can't be gone before the Antichrist is revealed. Because you can't let anyone deceive you into thinking that. There's a lot of Christians that believe that. Requires a second coming before the second coming. Because the second coming is the day of the Lord and it happens at the end. We Did we read about that? that it's happening at the end. We had plenty of scriptures that I quoted that, to make it very, very clear that the day of the Lord is the final day. So what they need is a second coming before the second coming. They need a secret rapture. It requires a second coming before the second coming. The rapture, resurrection and the second coming will occur at the last days at the same moment. That's why. That can't be true. It requires the day of the Lord to be a seven-year period. So instead of it being a single day when he returns, it's a whole period of time not the actual day that he returns. It requires scriptures to do with God's wrath to be relating to the great tribulation and not to hell. So it has the, the scriptures that I talked about with the thigh moo wrath and the organ wrath, that has to relate to tribulation and not to salvation. Or it can relate to both. They try to probably make it relate to both. In Revelation 16, 15, can we look there? This is a very important scripture as well for anyone who believes that the seven bowls of God's wrath maybe are different to the seven trumpets. Let's go to 16, 15. And we're going to go to, and God's, God in his mercy to his church for clarity purposes gives us key scriptures at key moments so that all of the issues that we have, all the misunderstandings we could have, can be cleared up in a moment. Let's have a look at this. It's, it's Revelation 16, verse 15. Actually, we'll go back a little bit. The sixth angel, go back to verse 12. The sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates. Happens that when you go to the sixth trumpet, it's also on the river Euphrates. That's why I believe there's a parallel. So you need to watch that video if you haven't to get a clear understanding about the, the, um, the trumpets and the, the bowls. But the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates and its water was dried up to prepare the way for the kings of the east, etc. Now go down to verse 15. 
And this is, be, this is after the sixth bowl. Jesus says this, and this is so that we can get this clarity. Behold, I come like a thief. Blessed is he who stays awake and keeps his clothes with him so that they may not go naked and shamefully exposed. Every reference to Jesus saying, I come like a thief, is in relation to his coming. Now, at the sixth, trump, uh, sixth bowl of God's wrath, Jesus says, behold, I come like a thief. That means he hasn't come yet. He just announces it just before the seventh bowl of God's wrath is put out. He says, I, I come soon. I'm coming soon, but I come like a thief, so get ready. So he warns us at the sixth bowl. So how could you be a pre in the pre-tribulation camp if you know that at the sixth bowl of God's wrath, Jesus tells us, and helps us to understand that he still hasn't come. He still hasn't come. Unless, of course, we have a secret rapture, which you can find nowhere in Scripture. It's so secret that God doesn't mention it. So what you have to do is you have to believe it blindly. I just believe it as a secret rapture. Why? Because my pastor told me. And why does he believe? Because his pastor told him. Why does he believe? Because some theologian told about a hundred of them one day. And some book they were reading commentary on the Bible was telling us about it as well. But they didn't handle the word of God correctly to make that judgment. Issues with the mid-trib rapture. It requires a second coming again before the second coming because we know that the rapture, resurrection and second coming occur at the last day. It requires the day of the Lord to be three and a half years, not the actual day of the Lord. So even if it's mid-trib, it still requires uh, the day of the Lord to be three and a half years long. It requires scriptures to do with God's wrath to be relating to the great tribulation and not to hell, just the same as the pre-trib view. In Revelation 16, 15, at the sixth bowl of God's wrath, Jesus is still to come like a thief. So that also is an issue that I have with the mid-trib. It requires a secret rapture which you can find nowhere in Scripture. Then there's the issues I have with the pre-wrath. There's not as many, but requires a second coming before the second coming because the rapture, resurrection, and second coming will occur at the last day. Well, I should say the resurrection and the second coming occur at the last day. And then we know that the resurrection and the second coming includes the rapture. It requires Scriptures to do with God's wrath to be relating to the Great Tribulation and not to hell. And Revelation 16, 15, which we just read about the sixth bowl of God's wrath, Jesus still to come. So it's very hard for me to then say, yeah, I'm pre wrath I'm before the wrath is poured out, when I read at the sixth bowl of God's wrath that he still hasn't come. So I, it's not whether I want to, it to be pre wrath or I want it to be mid-trib, or I want it to be pre-trib. I can't hold to those views because I either will have to give up belief in Scripture to hold to a view. Because the view is clear, the Scriptures are clear that Jesus hasn't returned pre-wrath. It requires a secret rapture, which you can find nowhere in Scripture. The post-trib rapture does not require a second coming before the second coming. The rapture, resurrection and second coming will occur at the last day at the same moment. It requires the day of the Lord to be the day of the Lord. Does not believe we will suffer the bowls of God's wrath, for Luke 21, 20 to 22 gives us warnings in advance of God's wrath being poured out, and it says in that scripture that when you see these things begin to take place, get out of the city, get out, you know, get out of Judea, it says in, in Matthew and Mark, if you're living in Judea. So he, he warns us. So it's sort of like doing the same thing he did with the Israelites, you know, when the destroying angel come, he says, all right, the destroying angel is going to come and kill the firstborn. So go to your house, don't come out of your house, put blood on the lentils and stay inside. He gives us clear instructions. He gave the Israelites clear instructions. He's already given us some already instructions. If, some, if this thing happens, get out of the city. So make sure you've got a four-wheel drive. Get out of the city. But, you know, we're, getting, we're given instructions. I'm not a doomsday prophet. All I'm saying is, Scripture tells us. And the words of Jesus are the spirit of prophecy. So in Revelation 16, 15, at the sixth bowl of God's wrath, Jesus is to come like a thief. And that agrees with post-trip. Because we don't believe he's, we've, we've gone before that. We believe that during the six bowl or seven bowls of God's wrath being poured out, which are the seven trumpets in my opinion, but you have to make your judgment in that. I believe that we're still there and post-trip, you, you have to be still there because that has to finish before it comes. 
Mark 13, 19, um, talks about distress unequaled, tribulation unequaled. Verse 24 says, following that distress. Verse 26 uh, says, at that time, following that distress, and that all agrees with the post-trip view. It just sits right in there. Now, did you know, in fact, it is commonly known and quoted by pre-trib theorists such as Chuck Messler. Anyone know Chuck Missler? I like some of his stuff, but there's some other stuff I can't swallow. But Chuck Missler uh, said this. This is a quote. The classical view of the rapture was always post-trib. Up until the uh, 1900s, up to about 1835, 1840, around there, the classical view pre that was always post-trib. So if that's the case, I would rather go with the disciples of John and the disciples of Paul and believe what they believe because they were closer to the fact. And the classical view, and even you know, honest pre-trippers will tell you that the classical view was always post-trip. But they believe they got a new revelation. Margaret MacDonald came and gave them a new revelation to do with a pre-trip rapture. And if you don't understand what I'm talking about, research Margaret MacDonald. Write that down. Research Margaret MacDonald and her uh, prophecies, so-called prophecies, that um, taught the uh, pre-trib view. And then there was a, a number of prominent ministers, Darby I think was one, who took that view and made it, you know, got more scriptures to support it. Gavin Finley, uh, remember Gavin Finley, he was in church a while back and I had him, I gave him an interview up here. And Gavin Finley said, the failure of the Western Church to understand and accept her vital role of witness in the 70th week right through to the end has resulted in a terrible moral crisis in the Western Church. The powers of darkness know all about the end time witness of the saints. They want to keep the Western Christians in the dark concerning this vital role of, the, of witness in the latter days. We're here as a witness during a time of what Jesus called the Great Harvest. Now, could the great harvest and the tribulation run side by side? If you can imagine terrible, terrible, terrible times taking place all over the earth, man, people come to Jesus. Right. You know, we saw our friend Kath, uh, Kath who uh, turned to Jesus because she was going through a terrible time. She was about to die. People turned to Jesus in those times. And what the church is wanting to flee. The church doesn't want to be there. The church doesn't want to help out in that time. So they hold to a view... That gives them this sense of, I'm missing out on all that. God's protecting me from it. But if it's not true, they're in big trouble. Because then they have to go through it forcefully. You know? Rather than enlist in the army, they get, they get uh, what's the word? Draw kind of conscripted. Conscripted. Yeah, pulled in. Forced to go through it. And then they, the Bible says they go AWOL. <laughs> Falsely represented post triple rapture. This is just to finish off. The post-tribulation view has been falsely represented by eschatologists. They teach that a post-tribulationist believe it is because of scriptures such as Acts 14.22, we must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. Uh, Romans 12.12, be joyful in hope, patient in tribulation, faithful in prayer. John 16.33, these things I have spoken unto you, that you and me you may have peace, but in the world you shall have tribulation, but be with you. So they say, oh, that's why they're post-trib. That's the only reason. I've heard an eschatologist recently say, this is the reason why post-trips believe that is because they save through much hardship. And then he went about pulling that down in the relation to his view. And I'm thinking, no, that's never been the reason I believe in post-trip. I believe it because this day of the Lord is the time that Jesus returns and that is in sync with the rapture. That's why. But then these scriptures make more sense. Through much tribulation, we must enter the kingdom of heaven. So then we go, okay, well, I'm going to have that attitude. I'm going to be a martyr witness for Christ. And you know what a martyr is? People will say, someone who dies for Jesus. No. A martyr, well, it is, yes, but it wasn't originally. When the uh, first Christians began uh, witnessing, they were called witnesses. And the word witness meant martyr is martus in, in Greek. So they were out there witnessing for Jesus Christ. And because so many of them were killed because of their witness... Martyr becomes synonymous with someone that dies for their belief. So that's why the word martyr means, you know, someone who lays their life down for Jesus. But it never meant that in the very beginning when Jesus said, "You will be my martyrs," or "My uh, you will be martyrs." In 
Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. They're, they're good scriptures that we've got to carry in our hearts. Through much tribulation we must enter the kingdom of heaven. But become warriors, become soldiers for Christ. Let's march forward in the power of the gospel. And the power of the Holy Spirit who will give us the, 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 the power to overcome all adversity. And not flinch in the face of suffering. That's how we have to be. As Christians... No one knows the hour of his return. They say things like, no one knows the hour of his return. Therefore, the post-trip view creates a predictability problem, meaning we can count off the years from the signing of the peace treaty with Israel and know the day of the rapture, which is the second coming. However, Daniel says in 12.11, uh, he tells us of a grace period after great tribulation before the Lord returns. So his return will still be unpredictable. He talks about a grace period occurring so the tribulation is finished and there will be still unbelievers alive because they're going to populate the millennium. Not the believers. The believers will serve in the temple with Jesus Christ. The millennium problem. They say a problem with it is who's going to populate the millennium, which is what I just talked about. As some believe that the tribulation saints will populate the millennium. Uh, however, Scripture says that all those in Christ that is coming will not experience the second death. They will not be part of the masses. Actually, when Jesus returns, those who are alive are going to receive their imperishable bodies. They'll be transformed as in the twinkling of an eye as you get raptured into the clouds by when the holy angel picks you up, takes you, you're going to be transformed into an imperishable body, can, can never die. That means the second death has no hold on us. We cannot suffer a second death. However, those that populate the millennium will, not all of them, hopefully, they will suffer a second death. Because it says at the end of a thousand years that... That after a thousand years of peace, that coveted peace that the world's always wanted and every beauty pageant has always wanted, they receive their peace and they, they come from the four corners of the earth. They come from Gog and Magog and they come and, they, and it's like sand on the seashore and they rebel against God and God the Father strikes them out and burns them all up and destroys them. They can't be Christians. They can't be those that had been alive at the second coming of Jesus Christ and were raptured. Because we receive imperishable bodies. We can't die. Amen? So that solves this, this millennium problem. Then they say this, this one. They also teach it can't be post-trib because that means that those believers who are alive at the coming of the Lord and are raptured then will go up and then straight back down again. I've heard a number of eschatologists say that. However, the scriptures tell us that those believers who are alive at the coming of the Lord will be raptured and be given imperishable bodies. It's not just a matter of going up and coming down again. You know, but they try to make it sound silly that we go up and then down again. Doesn't that sound silly if someone says, oh, yeah, that means it can't be a post-trip because that means the Lord will come, come, you'll be lifted up, and then you come straight back down. That sounds stupid. But that's not what happens. That's a misinterpretation, misreading of Scripture, and it's trying to lessen a very important topic. And it says, no, we are lifted up and transformed into our imperishable bodies, united with the Lord in the air, so that we'll be with the Lord forever. We will then follow him as he rides down to earth to conquer our enemies and the battle of Armageddon. And we'll be behind the Lord. It'll be like the cavalry has arrived. It'll be rejoicing. And we'll see our Lord you know, destroy his enemies with the breath of his mouth and with the sword that comes out of his mouth. And we will witness it. That's not going up and coming down again, and that's why you can't be a post-trip. Silly, isn't it? Can you see what I'm talking about? In the book of Revelation, there are clearly saints during the Great Tribulation at every point. Through the book of Revelation, as you read through, there are saints. It's always talking about saints, those that were slain, those that had heads removed, and they were under the altar. They'd just come out of the Great Tribulation, in the sense, through death, not through, trip, not through rapture. They were killed, and then they're... They were before the altar, and how long, O oh Lord, until you... What, what's the words they use there? I'm just having a blank. Avenge our death. Yeah, sorry, I normally have that one in my head. Thank you. But pre-trib and mid-trib believers say that they are converted after the church is removed. They call them, who's heard this? The tribulation saints. Who's heard that term? Tribulation saints, yeah. They're converted after the church is gone, and then they turn to Jesus. My answer to that is Romans 10, 14. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? If there are no members of the church on earth, and 
Preachers go so far as to say the Holy Spirit's removed. The, the restrainer is removed. Well, you can't even say Jesus is Lord without the Holy Spirit. So no, there can't be saints on the earth if the Holy Spirit's removed. That's that, that destroys that argument. And actually, the restrainer is Archangel Michael, and I'll talk about that another time. It's clearly Archangel Michael. But the uh, church is there because they have to be. Because how can they hear unless someone tells them? And how can they turn to Jesus unless someone preaches to them? Does that make sense? You need the church. The church, the, the world needs the church. We're here for the, to help unbelievers come to Jesus. That We're not supposed to be gone. You know, once we settle our minds on this, we say, okay, now this is the reason I'm a Christian. It changes everything. It changes your whole perspective. It changes your approach to, to the world and, and to life in general. So pray the Lord to raise up labourers to work in his harvest field. Now there's a few more scriptures, and with all this in mind, I won't read them now, but Revelation 12, 13 to 17, and Revelation 14, 9 to 13 are two scriptures that you can look at um, that also talks about, you know, um, that the, um, the beast that was after the woman, and the woman got taken away, and uh, um, and he, he got angry, and so he went off to make war against those that hold to the name of Jesus the followers of Jesus Christ, and he goes to make war with them. So that's saints on the earth during the tribulation. And Satan is angry. All right, I've, I've poured it out. <laughs> Ooh, I think my throat's a bit sore. Has that been a blessing? I, I hope so. And um, look, again, be Bereans in this. Go home, check me out. I'll try to get this sermon online as soon as I can, so you can go through it again, go through it again. Check out scriptures, read it, and there's more scriptures. I can find it. Um, there's a lot more scriptures that talk about the last day. Yeah. If you look up the last day and do a search on that, there are a lot more than I quoted. Um, but I believe, this is my own personal conviction, that this falling away could be a result of people, because 95% of evangelicals, they say, 95% believe in a pre-tribulation view. All the churches Vina and I have gone to in years past held to a pre-trib view. The churches in the West have been getting lulled to sleep like, don't worry, don't worry, you'll be gone before anything bad happens. <laughs> Off to sleep with you. And Christians aren't vigilant. Christians aren't like they used to be. And, uh, and so I believe that if you've been lulled off to sleep in pre-trib land and then bad things happen, Really bad things happen. The Antichrist rises and we see terrible times taking place. Once that happens, you, it's a recipe, as Joe Shibba would say, a recipe for apostasy. It's a recipe for a disaster on a proportion that only the Bible has described. The great falling away, the great rebellion, the great turning from Jesus Christ. Because my pastor told me for the last 25 years that Jesus Christ was going to keep me from this hour and I'm still here. And I don't like it. And this guy's got a, a knife and he says, if you give up Jesus Christ, you can live and you can walk out of here. Well, I give up Jesus Christ. I'm walking out of here. Because if that's wrong, everything he's been teaching me is wrong and I don't want any part of Jesus Christ. We don't want to be part of that. You know, our, our brothers and sisters in some of these countries right now are getting their heads removed for Jesus Christ right now. Yes. And I can guarantee if you talk to them, most of them would be post-trib. Because to them, they are going through a tribulation. Yes. It's not the great tribulation, but it is one or the same. Yes. Tribulation is tribulation. You know, if, you, you know, if you're in a house and it's surrounded by 100 Muslims and they're trying to kill you, they want to take off your head because you believe in Jesus Christ and they were told that you, you, uh, you know, destroyed a Quran. It's not true because a Christian wouldn't destroy a Quran. And they're going to kill you. That's a tribulation. Amen. Mm. And if they hold a knife to your throat and say, just all you have to do is give up Jesus Christ, you will be walking out of here. You can't become a Muslim. You know? And they're not. They're actually holding to the faith because their attitude is so important. You know, Corrie Ten Boom went over to China and the, the Chinese pastors come up to her and said, we have just suffered the most terrible falling away of the church. The church has fallen away by the thousands, tens of thousands, a massive falling away of the church because we taught them that don't worry, before anything bad happens, you're going to be out of here. 
But a tribulation come of a magnitude they didn't expect, it, it just took the church out in the sense of people gave up the faith. And they said, we've done a terrible thing. We should have made the Christians strong for persecution. We should have made the Christians strong for tribulation so that when it occurs, they're ready. And he, they, they all said to Corrie, go and tell the Christian church in the West that they must teach that the Lord will not come and rescue them from tribulation. You must teach that. But of course, even though she taught it, and it's got into many hearts, it's got into my heart, it's got into many hearts, Zach Poonin, Zach Poonin's heart, it got into his heart, and many others, um, still, it hasn't gone far enough, has it, that message? So this is why I preach this, this is why I'm passionate about this, because I think... You know, if you can keep the church, even in a small degree, the small degree that we can impact the church, keep the church from the falling away, the great falling away from the great apostasy, at least in our quarter of, uh, corner of the earth, then we've done a good thing for Jesus. Amen? Yeah. And so with that, I want to uh, just quickly tell you about next week. We're looking at the seven epistles to the seven churches. We're going to go through the... Um, seven epistles that Jesus wrote as letters. So they're the, the only letters that Jesus penned, if you use the pen. Pencil. Paint, I don't know. Charcoal. <laughs> Charcoal. Chiseled it on a rock. But it, these are the seven epistles that were written to the seven churches in Revelation. And it, it's going to be a great messages. Let's, I know because the Holy Spirit will be there and God will uh, give me the words and... and and I've got some really important stuff. And I think it relates to every Christian, these seven epistles. And they're very important to read and study. So I hope you can be there with us next week to hear those messages. And uh, let's pray just to finish off. Lord, we thank you. I thank you. Yes. And uh, we thank you that you helped me deliver the sermon today. And I pray that it, it, was, uh, it helped many people here to maybe consider something they may not have considered before. And I pray right now, Lord, that your spirit will just uh, help each and every one of us just to remain united in love and uh, not hold anything against anyone uh, in relation to these views. But, Lord, let the challenge go out there. So, Lord, as, as from, uh, for, for the most part, that this message would inspire us to live a more dedicated, more committed Christian life, uh, living for you with, at a level that we've not lived at, uh, for you before. And I pray this by the Spirit of God and in the name of Jesus. I just pray a real blessing over everyone here, that their week is, they have a wonderful week and that, uh, that they really have, have some incredible experiences with you as they seek you all week long. And may we see each other again next week as we continue this study in Revelation. So bless us now and be with us. And, uh, and I uh, ask all these things in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen.